Welcome everybody to Heart of the Matter. I am your host, Elizabeth Vargas. And today I'm talking to Cameron Douglas. He is the son of actor Michael Douglas and obviously comes from a family of great notoriety and fame and acclaim in Hollywood. Son of Michael Douglas, grandson of Kirk Douglas. But Cameron made some headlines of his own with his well-publicized battle with drug addiction and his experience serving seven years in prison. He was actually arrested in 2009 as part of a DEA sting operation. He was convicted of smuggling drugs, seven years in prison, and spent two of them in solitary confinement. It was a harrowing way to finally get clean. Um, He said at one point he was playing a game of chicken with his own life. He started smoking pot at the age of 13, started doing coke at the age of 15, crystal meth at the age of 17, and found himself later on addicted to both heroin and cocaine. I met Cameron when he was a teenager. I'm friendly with his family. So I've known him for many, many years. And when he wrote his book, Long Way Home, I was really amazed and blown away by how honest and open he was about his descent into what is really a hellish existence with his battle with substance use disorder and how long it took him to finally find a way out. And his experience, of course, behind bars. He's got a lot to say about the criminal justice system and how he criminalized the disease of addiction. I interviewed Cameron as part of Mobilize Recovery's virtual experience conference. You know, it's the end of September, which was recovery month dedicated to raising awareness and helping people find recovery. Cameron has a compelling, gripping story. I look forward to welcoming Cameron Douglas to Heart of the Matter. Thank you, Ryan. I am so excited to be part of this special edition of Heart of the Matter coming to you from Mobilize Recovery 2022. And I'm so excited to see you, Cameron Douglas. How are you? Well, that makes that makes two of us, Elizabeth. It's it's been a while and it's really yeah, good a few to decades. See you. Fantastic. <laughs> a few decades. As yeah. to you. <laughs> Who's counting? Yeah, exactly. Well, not me. Not me. <laughs> um, just first off, how are you? You've been You know, you wrote your book several years ago. I read it right when it came out. Um, It was amazing, I have to tell you. you. And I always ask people who write books about their own recovery. I wrote one myself. Why they decided to write a book. Because you are really honest about your battle with drug addiction, about your family. It's a very famous family that has actually tried to be very private. And yet you really open up yourself and the rest of your family for everybody to sort of read and, 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 and hear the incredible story. So why decide to write it? Initially, it was about turning uh, a negative into a positive. And, and quite frankly, it was also to give me some direction, something to sort of uh, sink my teeth into uh, upon coming home. Uh, And ironically, it was, it was my father's suggestion, and I was really, um, yeah. And I and I and I had sort of, uh, I was having trouble understanding why exactly, and I was hesitant. Um, but I think you know, after giving it some thought, and um, of course, we haven't really spoke about exactly why, but I think it's a couple of different reasons. I think you know, one, it was his way of. Um, sort of showing his love and just um, letting go and, and, and allowing this story to, um, to be shared with, uh, with, with everyone in the hopes that maybe it would be useful in some way. Um, and, and that made sense to me. And that was the idea, you know, it was not a book uh, with the intent of, of preaching or even um, suggesting, you know, what one should do uh, if, if indeed they do struggle with substances. But it was really uh, just an amalgamation of, of my experiences um, and what I went through, um, good, bad, or indifferent. And, and so that was 
that was sort of the the inspiration, I guess, was to just share and in doing so uh, be completely open and honest because I think that's the only way you really have uh, a chance at really connecting with people. And and if you can't connect with people, then it's just uh, not really going, going to be useful. So it's what, what, uh, what we came up with and I felt pretty good about it. Actually. You start the book, you start the book in 2003 and it's right after your uncle Eric Michael's brother has died of a drug overdose and you write I've been using drugs since I was 13 my current addiction is particularly nasty I inject coke as often as three times an hour my once promising career as a DJ has been completely destroyed by my irresponsibility I've had opportunities to make a life in acting and I've squandered them When my dad looks at me recently, I don't see love. I see concern and sadness and frustration. Maybe I really am like Eric, but I don't want to die like he did. And in the grip of a young man's sense of immortality, I'm not afraid I will. I'm so struck by that because you speak to the fact I have two teenage sons and I see, you know, in them that like, it won't happen to me. And even... In the midst of your addiction, as severe as it was, and even having your uncle die and seeing your father's grief and your grandfather's grief over that, you still don't think it'll happen to you? Well, um, as far as, as, as I can tell from my experiences, uh, one of the really tricky things about um, addiction uh, to, to substances in particular, I, I'm not... Um, too familiar with, you know, other types of addictions, but, uh, you know, people have different thresholds, uh, people, you know, some people get it really early on if they have, you know, a little scare and they realize, you know, I think it's also first important to know whether or not it runs in your family, because if it, if you do have a genetic predisposition, uh, towards it, I think it helps to be more aware, uh, that way, If you do notice it's starting to rear its ugly head in your life, you can kind of jump on it. And and some people are able to do that. Um, uh, Some people never get it. Uh, And unfortunately, uh, some of the best ones seem to to never get it. And some people get it at different points. You know, I was uh, and still am (laughs) pretty stubborn, uh, I would say. But, uh, you know, uh, that's and it took me. Well, you know, you know where it took me. It took me a, a long time and uh, a lot of uh, struggle, pain. But at the same, on, on, the, on the other side of that coin, uh, also uh, built a lot of character. I had lots of questions uh, about myself that I need, I needed answered, and uh, I can't really judge that experience until I'm taking some of my final breaths because I need to see. Uh, where I land in life. And at the moment, uh, things are going uh, pretty well. So I'm very grateful for that. You talk about that genetic predisposition. You have addiction on both sides of your family and obviously your dad's family um, and in your mom's. And you write also about how difficult it was to grow up the son and grandson of two iconic actors, um, Michael Douglas and Kirk Douglas. Tell me about that. I mean, what, you know, a lot of people would look at you and say, oh my God, you had it all. Good grief. You know, you grew up privileged, rubbing elbows with famous people. What, how on earth could that be bad? Explain. Uh, none of that was bad. And, and uh, I was very fortunate to, to be uh, fairly well educated, you know, uh, up until the point that I sort of, you know, had it within my power to, to not continue with, you know, that kind of education. And I uh, was uh, very fortunate to travel all over the world at a young age and learn about different cultures. And as you say, meet lots of interesting people. Um, so there's, there's nothing wrong with that. In fact, you know, the way I see it is that everybody's dealt a hand, you know, and, and uh, my, my hand was, was my hand and, and it was a lot of great things that came with it. And there were some drawbacks, um, certainly uh, way less than a lot of other people out there in the world. And the way that we choose to play our hands is, is up to us. 
In fact, I'll take that even a step further and I'll say that I have this funny notion that everyone is already everything they've wanted to be. It's just life is the process of, of realizing uh, that person and, and the choices we make allow us to get there or not. You did say, though, in the book that from an early age, quote, the seed was planted and that seed was low self-esteem. You write about feeling lonely as a kid. Yeah. Well, you know, so my mother had me when she was 19 or 20 years old. It's so um, young. Yeah. No, I, I remember I remember still uh, sitting on her bed while she was doing you know homework for some of her classes in university. Um and my father uh, was really just starting to get his career going. And as you know, my father is, is uh, very dedicated and, and a hard worker. And so he, you know, he was not around much uh, in my uh, formative years. Um, but it was never a lack of love in the house. Um, it was just sort of lonely. I guess at times, you know, and, and as I said, my mother was young and struggling with my father's uh, sort of rise to success and, and all the sort of intricacies that come with that. And she was trying to find herself as well. Um, and uh, so sometimes that left me uh, in the middle somewhere. In the middle and in reading the book, I get the impression a bit on your own. Yeah. Yeah. You started, you first tried drugs when you were 13 years old. I, I mean, if we can, if we can classify marijuana as a drug, I guess it depends what state you're in. <laughs> but yes, <laughs> these days, it sure the does. first time I smoked. Mar- <laughs> yeah. Um, How quickly did you graduate to, uh, to tougher substances? I think fairly quickly in the, you know, um, in the grand scheme of things, certainly, you know, it was, a bit of a different generation um, where like smoking and drinking and this kind of stuff was really considered like kind of cool and, 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 and macho for lack of a better, better term. Whereas I feel like these days, these, well, these kids are not uh, only more evolved. They just seem better educated and it's just, it's, it's not the same uh, allure that it, it once was. I, f- I feel like, in, at least in, in what I see in my younger brothers and sisters and, um, and their friends. Um, but yeah, I'd say fairly quickly. I think, uh, I think probably was introduced to cocaine maybe around 16 years old or something like that. And so, you know, and that's the one that I was really drawn to uh, for most of my young adult life. And yeah, I mean, I wouldn't say there's probably not much I haven't tried. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) That's a badge of honor, I guess. I don't know. Um, Uh, how old were you when you, uh, at least I can speak on it if if anybody asks. Yeah, Uh, exactly. I, (laughs) with authority, (laughs) um, I was right. Um, I was, let's say, um, maybe 17. Yeah. And how many rehabs have you been to? I want to say a handful. I don't remember exactly how many off the top of my head, but, but a, a handful, you know, between, you know, actual like rehabs, like 30 day programs, uh, and, you know, other kind of stuff that was, you know, I guess, trying to address um, not only addiction, but just, you know, sort of, um, you know, behavior, maybe out of control kind of behavior, um, certainly a, a healthy handful. You write in the book very um, honestly about the frustration of your parents. Um the anguish of both your parents in trying and failing to get you to quit. Um, I was particularly struck by one story you talk about in the late nineties when you had moved to New York city and your dad um, met you on the bench in central park 
and was had vans ready to take you off to rehab and you were angry. Tell me about that. In 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 retrospect, uh, as a parent, I mean, I I totally understand um, where he was coming from. Also, you know, I was, you know, as I just mentioned, just you know, it was a, uh, I was sort of a wild young man, and you know, not afraid to throw my weight around. Um, physically or otherwise. And, you know, so I think he was, you know, just desperate, you know, and, 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 and and from my perspective uh, at that moment, I was really, uh, I was in a bad place and not to say that, you know, a a good visit and a hug and a good, uh, you know, father to son talk would have done the trick. But I guess it's what I was really hoping for. Mm-hmm. And then to, to sort of be presented with that and then to find out that it was a ruse was made me really upset at the time. But, you know, right, as that I, you felt like it was a betrayal. I, yeah. At the time, I did. At the time, I did. In, in retrospect, I, I understand where he was coming from. And it would be impossible for him to have understood you know, my mindset at the time. Uh, I'm not sure I fully you, understood it. Yeah. You write in the book that it got worse and it eventually led to you being arrested at the Gansevoort Hotel um, mm-hmm. and going to prison, spending nearly two years of that time in solitary confinement. How did that happen? Why, why were you in solitary confinement? <laughs> To, well, essentially, I had a really difficult time adjusting. Uh, I was really angry. Um, in fact, I remember, you know, when I had been in for maybe a little over a year and I was in solitary confinement and it was maybe one of the first times that I'd, I'd been there. They, uh, they call it the special housing unit. And I remember uh, one of the officers came to my cell and said, Douglas, there's two ways you can do this. He says, you can do this. The easy way, which is at the time where I was, I was in a nice camp. Um, He said, or you can do this the hard way. And my sojourn through prison was very atypical in that I started at a minimum security and I worked my way diligently up to a medium high security. And that's normally not the route that's that one takes. And then that's, and that's what it was, you know, it's a, there is, you can do it uh, two ways. And, but at the time, you know, I was really just angry, angry at myself. And as a result of that, not, not getting along with, with people, uh, the way that I could have or should have to make it easier on myself, really, you know, it was mm-hmm. just made things more difficult for me. One of the things we, but, but ironically, I ironic, sorry to interrupt you, but you know, I feel like life is, is, is nothing if not ironic. And ironically, I, um, it was, it was during that time that I really, I reached a point, uh, in, in my life or, or my journey where, uh, I came to a crossroads and, and the path that I ended up choosing ended up, uh, you know, uh, being the right one. Uh, and I, I can say that from where I sit today for sure. It was while you were in solitary that you finally reached the point where you were willing to to give sobriety your all. No, I wouldn't say that. You know, that was that happened a little bit later, but it it, it was the beginning. You know, it was the beginning. I, I I remember the moment actually. I I had been called back, uh, you know, from the compound that I was at to to New York, and you know, went through. Uh, a lot of heartache and had to make some difficult decisions and and essentially those uh, I I ended up being sentenced to another five years uh, so you know the five year sentence turned to ten and I remember you know going back I was at the MDC in Brooklyn and I was in in the uh, in the box in the shoe 
And I remember coming back to my cell and there had been like a, a little bit of a riot on the, which is where guys uh, will plug, the, uh, they'll, they'll flood the, the range by plugging the toilets. And normally what you do is when we'll roll up a towel and put it under their door because all of your stuff is on the floor. There's no shelves or anything like that. But um, my room was flooded, all my books, papers, all this stuff. And I remember going into the cell and just sitting down on, on the bunk and, and sort of feeling some, something shattering inside of me. Um, and I sort of realized at that point I had two choices. You know, I could, I could take, you know, one path um, that I have no idea, you know, where, where that would have taken me at this point, uh, fortunately, uh, or I could take another path. And, and the sort of crux of that path was taking back some of my freedom. And I did that by, you know, making choices that I felt would put me in the best position to achieve some of my goals and aspirations when I was finally let out. And even though that was seemingly a long ways away it sort of gave me the inspiration that i needed to like literally get myself out of the bunk every morning and and uh and as i said try to make yeah, look at each uh, obstacle as an exercise and then sort of you know build uh, uh with everything else that i was capable of sort of getting my hands on how much longer after you had that sort of moment by yourself in that cell when you realized I have, I have a choice here, <laughs> one, one fork takes me down a really bad path. I'm on a bad path. You'd been on a bad path for a long time at that point. <laughs> right. It's hard. It's hard to imagine going down. There's, you can always go down. You can always go down. You can always go up, you know, no matter where you are. Right. So how long after you made the choice, I want to go up, did you get out of prison? Oh, uh, so I'd say good six years, six years more, you know, so yeah, yeah. And it was in, in, and, you know, I would never, ever, uh, sit here and tell you or anybody else that pri uh, prison incarceration is the answer for, for substance abuse, because I don't believe that it is, but, uh, those were those were years that I made. I feel like I made good use of, you know, and I can look back on those years and feel good about, you know, my mindset and the direction that I was headed uh, during that. For people who still think that it's appropriate, I, because there are we're still doing it. So obviously people still think it's appropriate to incarcerate people suffering from addiction. Sometimes they commit crimes and that's what happens. Um drugs are available in prison. I mean, you know, you, you don't, you're not going to send somebody to prison or jail and they're going to get sober because they don't have access to drugs or alcohol. Drugs or alcohol are there, yes, right? They are. They are. And, you know, I would say, I think, you know, in regards to you're saying people committing crimes based on their addiction, I think, I think the sort of the hard line is uh, uh, violent or nonviolent. You know, and, and that's really where I think uh, judges and prosecutors need to make the distinction. Um, if they're nonviolent crimes fueled by addiction, prison's just not, it's, it's not the place to be. And in fact, I can tell you of my own experience. And as I said, I did most of my time in high security prisons where guys are never going home. You know, they're dangerous, you're some dangerous people. But I would say, uh, boring uh, sex offenders, um, because I don't I don't know the, the the number. I mean, I don't really know how to address that. But but boring sex offenders, I would say maybe twenty percent, probably closer to fifteen percent of the inmate population needs to be in prison based on being a risk to uh, society in terms of you know safety to civilians. Um, other than that, you know, you you could have. The majority of these men and women uh, out on the streets under some some serious monitoring, and they do do <laughs> serious monitoring 
uh, and, and working a job and paying taxes and being at home with their families and, and uh, everything like that. So, um, but, you know, it's, it's one of those, you know, it, as, as advanced as this country is uh, when it comes to our penal system, you know, we're like, you know, we're back at square one. Uh, and you see that by how some of these other countries in Europe, for example, uh, approach um, the same situation and the results are, you know, unquestionable. Right. The European system is much more mm-hmm. focused on rehabilitation uh, than the United, than the American system. And, which and is humanizing uh, individuals, you know, because another problem with uh, the system here is you send a lot of these uh, individuals that are not necessarily criminals uh, when they go to prison. But, you know, after so many years and essentially, you know, you treat somebody like an animal for long enough and they're going to start acting like an animal. And, uh, and that's, that's what they address, I think, very well in some of these European countries. You know, they really, they treat the individuals like humans. You know, they realize they have families. They allow them to, you know, to, uh, to uh, keep these ties, which are so important. You know, once, once you lose that, you know, once you sort of lose touch of the people that you love and things that are important in your life, it's, it's uh, you know, you, you start acting in ways that you didn't realize you were capable of. What was it like when you finally got out and were you at all worried that you would relapse at all, that the freedom of the, from the prison walls would take you back into the prison of your addiction? Um, that's a great question. Um, so outwardly, uh, I felt like it was going to be a breeze for me. This is, I'm going to answer this question a, a couple different, uh, steps. So, uh, so outwardly I, I, and the, how I let on was that this, you know, uh, some friends of mine would say to me, you know, Cameron, you've been down for a while. It's going to be an adjustment to this. And I'd be like, and I'm going to say, you guys are crazy. I'd say, that's where I belong. This is not where I belong. It's going to be easy. I'm dying to get out there. But uh, realistically, I think internally, I, I, I had some reservations. I certainly had some real reservations about, uh, as you say, just diving right back into addiction. Because at that point, Um, you know, when I was let out, I had been sober for, I'd say about two years. Um, and, and so Mm -hmm. I was, yeah, I, I mean, most of my life, um, I sort of behaved and interacted and partook in, in, uh, in one way. Um, and I was, I was nervous about, you know, what it was going to look like coming home. Although, as I said, I spent probably six or so years since I had that, that moment where I sort of chose to take the higher path and, and really did every day. My, my inspiration, my motto was like, you know, each day needs to work towards putting me in the best position when I'm finally released. And, and I, and, and, uh, and that's how I, that's how I lived and that's how I operated um, even before I got completely sober. Um, and so the big test was going to be coming home. Uh, but in fact, and I used to think maybe right. like, you know, <laughs> these traits like discipline and work ethic were just traits that I somehow inherently didn't come with. Like maybe I just wasn't put together properly. Uh, although in prison, I realized in fact that I did have tremendous amount of discipline and focus, um, and so I'm happy to say that uh, it, it, it has not been an issue then and it's still not an issue now. So, so I did something right there along the way that sort of uh, that, that, that stuck. Do you struggle at all um, with I know that I'm in recovery and part of the thing I struggle with still to this day, even many years sober, is I, I can look back sometimes and like just go, like beat myself up about mistakes I made or opportunities I might have squandered or, you know, decisions I made that turned out to be selfish or destructive. Like I have a difficult time forgiving myself 
Do you struggle with that at all? I do. You know, it, especially when things are not going my way um, or things are proving to be more difficult than I had anticipated. Um, and I'm just uh, hard on myself, I think, uh, by nature. Um, but I, what I sort of hang my hat on when, when that becomes too much for me, and it does, you know, sometimes I, I literally have to have a conversation with myself and be like, Cameron, give yourself a break, you know? And, and the reality is, 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 again, is that I don't know exactly where this journey is going to take me, but I know that I'm putting my best foot forward. Um, and I also feel that what the experience, uh, and wisdom that I've gained, uh, through uh, the choices that I've made in my life are going to play a big role in where I'm headed. So, and that's, and, and I do believe that, you know, but it is easy for me to, to beat myself mm -hmm. up too. And I think that's just, you know, uh, just the way it is. Yeah. Yeah. You are a dad yourself, which is a little hard to believe. I, <laughs> I mean, I still think of you as a teenage kid. I still feel like a teenage kid. <laughs> um, how has being, <laughs> how has being a father changed your perspective on all of this? Um, because you now have children, so I'm sure you can better understand the anguish your dad and mom felt watching you self-destruct. Um, you must look at these kids and think you want to protect them from anything and everything bad. I mean, just how has it changed your perspective on everything, on your recovery and on your addiction? Well, first of all, it's just been so much fun. I, uh, I really love being around my kids. I just, uh, there's, there's nobody in the world that I'd rather be around uh, than them. And so that's, it's been really a lot of fun, uh, a lot of laughs. You know, they're at the age my daughter's four and a half and my son is uh you know uh one and a half you know he was born he was born uh the day after three years later so her birthday is the 18th this is the 19th of december so it's kind of funny but they're at that really uh wow. you know great age and but it's interesting you know already my daughter i start to see things you know and and i guess you know i realize uh that's, you know, even though they're small and cute and pure and innocent right now, they're going to have a, a journey uh, themselves and, you know, are already uh, on the path. And, and I just try to do my best to be a good uh, influence, <laughs> you know, just trying to figure it out as, as, as I go. Um, but uh, yeah, of course, you know, you, you don't want to see uh, anything bad happen to uh, anyone that you love, especially your children. And, and, and as you say, uh, definitely becoming a parent uh, gives you some insight as to, you know, what my parents were going through and, and uh, contending with. And, um, hopefully my children are a little easier on me. What do you think you understand now about what your parents went through that you didn't understand before? I don't know. You know, maybe the sort of balance that one understands a little bit more uh, when they do, when they are an adult, when they are trying to juggle um, providing uh, for the family as well as, you know, feeling purposeful uh, and inspired uh, yourself, you know, because we, I, I don't, I mean, I certainly have a life to live, you know, things that I want to uh, accomplish, you know, that really have nothing to do with my kids that are just for me, you know, and, and by proxy, hopefully they'll uh, affect my kids mm -hmm. uh, uh, positively. Uh, but there's a, there's a balance there that I, that I think as a kid, uh, you don't, really understand nor should you um but uh so that, that, that would be my answer to that great question 
what will you tell them about your journey, about your real struggle and real triumph? If uh, anything that they, they ask me, I will tell them. Um, I'll try to frame it in the best way possible. Um, but, you know, completely, I'm, I'm going to be uh, uh, open with them. Uh, they, you know, my daughter's already, you know, she's kind of realizes, you know, I feel like, you know, she loves it. Tattoos. I obviously have a lot, but she knows it's I'm different, a little different than, than maybe, you know, some of the other daddies. And that's good. I, I'm, I'm happy to, to be different. Um, and, uh, and yeah, I will also, uh, tell her and my son, whatever, whatever they're curious about knowing about me. And, and of course, I'm, I would imagine at, at, at one point they'll probably read the book. The idea is that when, when that day comes, <laughs> I'll be in a position uh, that uh, will give me a little bit of cushion uh, to soften the blow <laughs> once they read it. <laughs> you will have earned some good stock, in other words, exactly. already. Exactly. Um, since getting out from prison and on the road to recovery, you have uh, gone back to pursuing acting. How is that going? And it's got to be daunting to come from the dynasty you do. You don't just have a super famous, super successful father. You've got an iconic grandfather who you were able to spend some time with in the last years of his life. Um, sober in the backyard, teaching your daughter how to swim in his swimming pool. That must have been amazing. It was. It was um, It was very special. Uh, my my grandfather and I have, have always been really close. Um, so to, to get to spend, um, I'd say, you know, the final four or five years of his life with him, um, you know, almost on a, a daily basis was, was really, uh, beautiful. And, um, so that, but uh, so it's funny. The, so the acting thing is, <laughs> as far as those two are concerned, um, you know, in my early twenties, you know, when I first kind of started getting into acting, I never even gave it a, a, a thought, you know, it was just kind of like ignorance is bliss mm. kind of thing. And, and, uh, and, you know, now it's something that I'm a little more aware of. In fact, it's, it's funny that you, you bring it up because I, I think I was thinking about it a little bit the other day or something. And it is, it's a little, um, it's inspiring and also it's like a little bit of like a, a fire under you, you know, and always not the nicest way, you know, like you really, you know, mm-hmm. you want to, I want to make my mark as well. Um, and, but it's, it's, it's good. Of course, uh, <laughs> when I came home, I thought that I was going to take Hollywood by storm, like right out of the gate. Um, and that's, was not the realities. Uh, so it's just been, it's been some years of really, you know, working on the craft, but also I came to a certain point where I was forced to ask myself whether or not I really believed in, in what I had to offer. Uh, because the truth is, is until you're making people a lot of money, uh, the majority of people are not really going to buy into, to what, what you have, which, which, what you're offering. And if, if that's your main concern, uh, I think it's going to be too difficult. You know, as you know, it's, it's a business of, of rejection and there's a lot of it, even for people that are in great, uh, places in their careers. So right. if, 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 uh, if, if you're not, and you're working to be, there's going to be that much more of it. Um, so for me, that was really, I remember actually it was like two years ago, you know, just rejection after rejection with the auditions and this and that. And then, you know, I was, I had sort of had this, uh, you know, talk with the man in the mirror and just said, look, do you believe in what you have to offer? And in fact, I do uh, in my heart and in my bones. And after that moment, it sort of freed me up, uh, which was nice. It was good for, you know, for, for acting, it was good for writing. It was just good for, for everything in general. Um, 
So, so that's it. So things are starting to to come together as as they do. Um, and I'm mm-hmm. working as an actor. Uh, I got a couple of things lined up, and uh, and doing a lot of writing and developing, and uh, really enjoying that. Inspired by that, and also, you know, I think uh, right right where I want to be at, at this point. So, in your book, you write about sitting with your dad and him turning to you and you write one day we're hanging out and he says, I don't know how you did it, how you went through the things you did. Do you wonder that too? Like, do you look back at all those years and all those rehabs and all that prison and all that, that time in solitary confinement and think, holy cow, how did I do that? How did I survive that? Well, firstly, I mean, there there were also uh, a lot of really great times we've through those years. Um, I know it's, you know, when we're talking about this, we sort of focus on, you know, the not so great times, which, which makes sense. Um, but thank goodness there's some good times to counterbalance <laughs> everything. Um but you know, two things that I that I learned about humans uh, while I was in prison uh, is the amazing will that human beings have to survive, and the amazing ability that human beings have to adapt to their surroundings. For instance, I think if you look at most animals in nature, if you take them out of their environment, uh, normally they don't do too well. Uh, humans. Uh, are incredibly adaptable and i think that's one of our uh, secrets coupled with the will that we have to to survive it's just embedded in us so when people say to me i don't know how you did it i could have never done it i say to them i think you could have you know hopefully you, you won't have to be in that mm-hmm. situation but i think you you absolutely could have um but uh but yeah it was it's you know, I like to think that you get what you paid for. I paid a very high price, uh, and I plan on on uh, on getting what I paid for. Cameron Douglas, congratulations on the book. It is inspiring, and um, you know, I think people can read this and think. In if you, it's a real inspiration in terms of what you can endure, what you can, as you just said, adapt to. What can you? take from it and learn to thrive and recover. I'm so happy that you're doing so well. Congratulations on the family and the burgeoning career. And I hope there are many more years of wonderful recovery ahead of you. Thank you. Thanks so much. It's it's really, really nice to uh, to see you again. And I will, I will indeed. And I just wanted to say, it's really, really nice to see you again and, and uh, speak with you. You look fantastic. And I will pass along your your kind sentiments. Thanks, Cameron. Thank you so much for listening to Heart of the Matter. As a reminder, if you need help with a loved one struggling with substance use, you can text JOIN to 55753 or visit drugfree.org. You can find this podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and on our website at drugfree.org slash podcast. And if you enjoy what you hear, please consider leaving us a rating and review on your favorite podcast platform. We'll talk to you soon.